those who appreciate the work that we're doing here on Standing for Truth, please hit that subscribe button because we are just getting started. They feel that this one actually defeats biblical creation, as we know it won't, but uh, multiple meteorites, moon rocks, and Martian rocks dated on location all yield a consistent age of 4.6 billion years plus or minus a few. This is true across a variety of locations, across a variety of different dating well, methods. We don't, How would you explain um, this? We don't have any access for sure to anything from Mars by which we could date it. Um, it's thought that some of the rocks that we collect on Earth that are meteorites may have originally been from Mars. I'm a little skeptical of that. We, don't, we certainly don't know that's the case. We do have rocks from the moon. And those have been dated using the, uh, the uranium lead, I believe, method and perhaps others. And yeah, you do get ages of 4.5 billion years, which you don't get for earth rocks, interestingly. Uh, they don't get quite, you don't get quite as old ages for earth rocks. So, but the secular thinking is that the, you know, earth's been reworked by plate tectonics. And so you, you don't have original earth rocks They're, They've all been reworked multiple times. Uh, what's the explanation for that? Well, we think that there's very compelling evidence that the rate at which radioactive decay has happened in the past has been accelerated. And that would account for why there tends to be a convergence on a particular age for rocks that are not earth rocks. For earth rocks, you get, you get inconsistent ages. You can take an earth rock and date it using one method and then date it using another method and you get different answers. And this has been well documented. Uh, John Woodmerappy's book, The Mythology of Modern Dating Methods, documents published dates. These are ones that have been peer reviewed. They're published in the peer reviewed literature to say nothing of the dates that were inconsistent and therefore never published. I mean, think about that. Think you're a secularist and you date a rock and it gets you an age that's way off what is expected to be for that formation. Probably don't publish it. You say, well, obviously something went wrong there. And so uh, the, the fact that you have inconsistent data, even within the literature that was published, suggests that there's a far greater uh, number of inconsistencies that have not been published. The the rate uh, research project too, in their in their book, they also documented there's a chapter on on the discordant date. So it's not it's not as consistent as you've been led to believe. Now I do think it's a little more consistent for uh, moon rocks because they haven't been reworked. There's there was no worldwide flood on the moon. Uh, and so th whatever process God used to make the moon apparently was pretty uniform. And so uh, even though the decay rates have been accelerated, there's good evidence for that. Read the rate research on that. Uh, presumably it happened at a uniform rate. And so that's why you get consistent, some degree of consistency with moon rocks, but very little consistency with earth rocks. Yeah, uh, there probably is some kind of maybe enhancement of the decay rates. For example, here's something. Um, when they went to the moon and they got the, one of the first moon rocks and they brought it back, I forget the exact number of what they identified it as. Oh, here it is. Lunar sample 14321. It dated at 4 billion years old. But when they tested it, it was actually a piece of driftwood from Earth. But the oldest tree dated is 350 million years ago on Earth. So how could that even be a thing? I'm just curious if, if you ever heard about that or... I haven't heard about that specific one. I have heard of examples of, um, for example, wood that's embedded inside rock. You know, volcano will come, uproot trees, lava will flow over it. So you have wood embedded in, in rock and the rock dates to millions of years and the wood dates to thousands of years. So that's that's a problem. And, and in case people are wondering, the, the when you date a rock, it's supposed to tell you when the rock hardened. Because before that, everything's liquid. It can, the minerals can move in and out. But when it's when it solidifies, then that's supposed to trap the parent and daughter elements. And so the only way you get daughter elements is by the conversion of parent elements. And yet you get wild inconsistencies. So this is it, inconsistencies in radiometric dating is not new. It's well known. And um, we, we've taken rocks from Mount St. Helens, brand new rocks, sent them into secular labs to have them dated. You get hundreds of thousands of years on brand new rocks. So we know radiometric dating does not work on rocks of known age. It's assumed to work on rocks of unknown age. And I think that's not very scientific. Yeah. Matter of fact, you mentioned accelerated nuclear decay. So if this was occurring maybe during the flood or even during the creation event, would this have also made these dates unreliable? Yeah, if you assume that the decay rate is constant, when in fact it was faster in the past, your ages will be inflated. And they'll be inflated by the degree to which you assumed that something was constant divided by the rate at which it was accelerated as a rough, as a rough uh, uh, measurement. So if the decay rates were millions of times faster during the flood year, for example, 
And, and there's, there's great, there's very compelling evidence for this because the fact is when, when uranium, for example, when a uranium atom, uh, it decays into the next element, which decays into the next one, all the way down to lead 206, uh, for every one uranium that turns into a lead 206, it emits uh, in that process of radioactive active decay, it emits eight helium nuclei. So it produces helium as a, as a byproduct. And helium is a gas and rocks are porous. And so gas can leak through rocks and it doesn't take millions of years for that to happen. And so the bottom line is if the, if the rate at which the uranium turned into lead had always been the slow rate that it is today, that, that the helium that's produced would have had plenty of time to escape. There should be very little helium in these rocks. And the rate research team found that there's abundant helium trapped inside uh, these rocks that have radioactive elements in them. And it's consistent with all of that decay having happened in the recent past, thousands of years ago. Now there is a temperature dependence in terms of the rate at which the helium leaks through, but in order for it to accommodate the data in, in billions of years, the temperature would have been close to absolute zero, which is absurd because the temperature actually gets hotter as you go in toward the earth because the earth has a molten core. So uh, there are compelling evidence that the radioactive decay rates were much faster in the past. There, there's been this opinion in the last, few decades, well, previous to the rate research and a few other uh, uh, research projects by secularists actually, there was this opinion that radioactive decay rates cannot be influenced by any external parameters because when, when you do chemical experiments, it, it tends not to affect the radioactive decay rate. But we now know that it's false. There are some ways of accelerating certain kinds of radioactive decay. For example, the, uh, the rhenium osmium reaction has been sped up in a laboratory by a factor of a billion. And all you have to do is strip away the electrons from the rhenium and it will decay much, much more quickly. So, and that's just, that's one method. That's a method we can do. Uh, God obviously has options that we don't have. Uh, God could change this, the nuclear strong force by a bit and uh, that would change the rates of decay and so on. So there, there, are, a lot, there are different ways in which radioactive decay had, could be accelerated. We think there's good evidence that happened during the flood year. And that would explain why the secularists, uh, not including that factor, get ages that are far older than the true age, uh, including on things whose true age is known um, because it happened in recorded history, for example. Uh, makes sense. Do you think that this accelerated nuclear decay would have caused what they what they deem as the heat problem? They said, you know, this this uh, convection and the, uh, the subduction plates would have caused so much heat generated during this nuclear uh, process that the heat, the oceans would have boiled. Have you heard of this? You have an yes, I've heard of that. Yes. Um, I, I haven't seen um, a detailed uh, study on that other than uh, I have, there are ways to dump the heat. First of all, you do, you need heat. You need heat to start the flood. So that's not a bug, that's a feature. <laughs> uh, to get the plates moving, they need energy and an acceleration of radioactive decay, that's a great way to start plates moving, uh, to heat them up to where they can be hot enough, where they can be almost a, not quite a liquid state, but it makes them more um, malleable. Uh, where did the heat go? Well, we don't know. We, first of all, we don't know what the Earth's temperature was in, in the core, for example, before the flood year. What if a lot of that energy is now, what if it's still there, what if it's still in the core? A lot of the energy could have gone into that. A lot of the energy could, be, could have been dumped to space. There have been uh, creationist models of uh, hypercanes, for example, which is like a hurricane, but on a much more massive scale. Hurricanes are very good at dumping heat, dumping energy uh, to space. They, when, when a hurricane goes over the ocean, the ocean's temperature drops by 10 degrees. And that's a piddly hurricane. Imagine a hypercane that's taking all this energy and dumping it into space. Convection is a great way to, to move heat quickly. It's the best way to do it. And we think there was a lot of convection during that flood year. So there probably were spots on the ocean, hot spots that boiled. There probably were. But as soon as they get to the air and they spray up and then they, they lose that heat and so on, they lose it to space. So there are lots of ways of dumping the heat and perhaps a lot of the heat is still in Earth's interior since we don't know what the original Earth's interior, we don't know how hot it was to begin with. Some of the energy could have gone there. There are other explanations for that. Um, I don't have the numbers with me to see, you know, which of these is the most plausible, but but there are some possibilities right there. So certainly it's not a, a knockdown drag out argument against a uh, accelerated decay because it produces heat. That's a feature. We need some heat to start the flood. And as long as you can dump it to space fast enough, you're going to be fine. Right. That was uh, that was a really good answer. Probably one of the best I've heard on that. Um, 
specific criticism from uh, your critics that say there's an, un an unsolvable heat problem. And I've seen you, Dr. Lyle, speak on accelerated decay quite a bit. I, I saw you brought um, up the helium and zircons in a debate mm -hmm. you had with Dr. Ross, but this was one I think years ago where Frank Turek was, was moderating. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't exactly thrilled with Hugh's response. I, I think you got him on that one real good. And I guess you did kind of just answer this actually, but the question would be what what are some of the best responses to, to critics who say, because I, I constantly hear them still continuously repeat this, even though you just gave a huge number of overwhelming lines of evidence suggesting accelerated nuclear decay has occurred, but they still say, nope, this isn't possible. It's never been observed in the lab. What's a good quick response to, to um, these critics who make that? Well, it has been observed in the lab. There, there's no doubt about that. Have them look at the Rhenium-Osmium reaction. Right. Uh, bound state beta decay. It, it, that re you can make that, that rhenium decay a billion times faster than it does in normal circumstances in nature. And, and, and granted, I'm, I'm not suggesting that that's the solution to all of them. I'm not, I'm not suggesting that, um, you know, that all the material was ionized and things like that. But my point is, if you want to blow away this assumption the, the assumption that radioactive decay rates are always constant is false. It's demonstrably false. That has been disproved in a laboratory. Now, that doesn't automatically mean that decay rates were faster in the past, but it does mean that that's, that's a possibility. It's, it's not something that can be dismissed out of hand. I do think the, the, the helium in the, in the zircons is just, I don't know how secular sleep at night with, with that data, because how do you explain <laughs> that? In, in billions of years, there's been plenty of time for that helium to escape. We know the rate at which it's at which it leaks through rocks. That's been measured, and there's just no way you can make sense of that. I'm not an evidentialist, but at the same time, I don't I don't see a good rescuing device even for that. Right. So I think the evidence is very compelling for accelerated decay, and in any case, we have tested radiometric dating on rocks of known age, and it often gives the wrong answer. So that that immediately. As a scientist, just, just somebody being an objective scientist, you should say, we really shouldn't have a lot of confidence in that method because we know it gives wrong answers on dates of known age. So it, it doesn't make sense to trust it on dates of uh, estimated ages for things that whose origin is not known. <laughs> right. I, I think you nail it with that, Dr. Lau, where you say, we don't get accurate dates from rocks of known age, but yet they want us to trust the rocks of unknown age and, and the dates they, it just seems common sense not to yeah. so, um, right.